welcome everyone. Um, glad to be here. My name is Jaime Dominguez. I'm going to be the moderator for your session today. Um, currently, uh, Chief Marketing Officer at, at World Football Summit. Um, today, I'm glad to welcome uh, Camila Garcia, Director of the National Association of Women Football Players um, of Chile, and Karen Sendel, Chairman of the Israeli Women's Football Players Association. Perhaps what is more relevant today is that uh, they're both board members at FIFPRO. Um, in the case of Camila, she's actually a former player and Karen is still active. So I really, um, I think uh, it would be difficult to find someone um, or, or, or two people who are more adequate to talk about today's topic, which is the professionalization of women's football. Um, before really going into some of the questions and, and some of the topics that we will um, uh, discuss today, um, just to let everybody know, we will have 10 minutes for questions at the end, so more or less at around, uh, the webinar is going to last at, uh, until about 5 more or less, so at around 4.50 we'll open up the floor for questions. If, if you can submit your questions in the questions tab rather in the, than in the general tab, it's going to make my job uh, much easier, so I would appreciate that. Um, just to introduce the topic a little bit, I mean, I think everybody here knows that uh, 2022 has been a remarkable year for women's football. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, nobody can, can doubt that. Uh, you see it everywhere. You see it in, in record attendance figures in the stadiums, uh, in, in the Euros uh, with FC Barcelona. Um, you see it in record-breaking broadcasting deals and, and, you know, investment rounds and, and partnerships and new sponsorship deals all over the place. No? Um, and, and really, the, the projections uh, are just amazing. No? So uh, there's numbers that say that by 2020, 2033, actually, um, the commercial value of the women's game is going to be pretty close to 700 million euros, uh, and that there's going to be so many, um, you know, uh, so much growth in terms of uh, fans uh, really being attracted to the game. No? Um, but I guess the, the the you know the question is uh, wh wh what's next? No, how how can we you know how can we unlock the next level of growth? Uh, because there's still many challenges. Um, to really uh, drive greater professionalization of, of the game. No? At, at, and, and, and really, that's one of the levers that are um, key, that, that is key, um, as we will see uh, later on. No? Um, before going into the questions, not sure if uh, Camila, Karen, do you want to say hello to the audience? Um, and if not, we can just jump right in. No, just to say that we're super excited to be here, at least me, and um, it is a pleasure to to finally meet you virtually, but it's great. And I think it's, it the topic is very relevant and I'm excited that we have like a very positive response to, to this topic. So thank you. Yeah, I, I feel exactly the same and, and I'm happy to be here and, and meet uh, you virtually as well. And, and I think the fact that we're talking about this subject um, and the fact that it's, it's on you know the table and, and something that people are interested in um, is is great to see but it's also one of the steps uh, to, to professionalize in the women's game yeah definitely um, overall I mean at World Football Summit we've noticed uh, similar similar acceptance in terms of finally getting you know recognition to the women's game which which it's so um, so deserved and so necessary, no? Um, I guess my, my, my first question uh, for you both, I guess, you know, uh, based on the introduction that I just gave, um, what do you believe are the real reasons uh, for this boom that we've seen in recent years around um, uh, women's football? Uh, Camila, Karen, whoever, I mean, just have this conversation, whoever wants to jump in, please feel free. Do you want me to start, Karen? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I think it's, I've been asked this question before and I think it's a mixture of things. Um, but if I have to choose like one concept, it is what like the introduction that you gave. It's, it's more visibility uh, to the game, uh, making sort of, making it a, a priority, not only in the field, but the, in the political agenda on the governing bodies. It's like, we have seen a synchronization of different things that had made that possible. I would say in the past, increasingly for the past six or five years, it's been booming. Um, but if we if we try to say like why, um, 
I, I can avoid to say, at least coming from uh, Latin America, that the wave of feminism uh, that had put women uh, in the political and the social uh, agenda has certainly helped a lot um, because it has created um, gradually a network of allies uh, in the political sphere, in the private sector, in the sort of the federations, um, and it has pushed for change in the structural system. Uh, and that network of allies that facilitated many discussions. Um, and I think that we can sort of, I think it's necessary to, to recognize that and, and that we have been like pushed by this wave of women that not necessarily come from the, the, the world and the, the sports world or the football world, but it has definitely been um, really helpful for us, at least in my country, um, if we didn't have certain allies in Congress, for example, or in NGOs or like different areas, it wouldn't be possible to be where we are today. Um, I think economics is another point. Uh, in general, if you see the trends of like, I don't know, the past 40 years, now women are like have more purchasing power and that means that the market is shifting. Uh, and I think one of the problems is that we still see football in a way that in the lenses of the audience that was 40 years ago. Uh, and that's and that I think is one of the main issues. Like we need to see what's go going on now with the audiences. And you have referred to the breaking records of the stadiums. And, and we have heard many times about this argument that at first it was, well, yeah, women's football is growing, but only because the national teams are like pushing it. And now you see breaking records of Barcelona or in Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, would everywhere and it's like well but so it, there's always an argument to sort of uh put down a little bit like the audience is changing is more di diverse for certainly than before but we need to make that sort of a reality and being driven by data and not about like our bias and like discrimination that is underlying the the, the top decisions um another point i would make is technology for sure um, talking about visibility, uh, if we, I was, I was, I went to the, the final of, of the, the women's league here in the US and it was striking to me to hear that it was the first time that the final was broadcast by national television. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, but in the US, that, that should have happened like yeah. many years ago. No, it's the first time. So it's like, wow. So before they, they, they were in different platforms, but that make that made made it visible. And if we talk in Sweden and in Latin America and Africa, they're using all these new platforms to make it visible, and the journalists can tap in. And like it, it creates a sort of a positive cycle of things that even for the players. So if they don't have a platform so they can be seen, it's almost impossible to be transferred. It's almost impossible to like dream of being a professional so it seems like it's a marketing side but it's clearly and directly i mean uh connected to 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 the performance and how they how they um evolve over time and and i think what, what we sort of again like journalists have a, a main role in this um we have seen how many, many, mostly, I don't know if in other latitudes, but at least in the Americas, many women have focused on women's sport and they have like rise in the, the sort of the discussions and, and making more profound that they, they're even, um, so when, when we started in Chile, for example, the union, like the players association, our first sort of two years, I would say, was making it visible that we exist, we're here, we play, there's a league, uh, and we sort of went to social media and like, these are the results of the league, blah, blah, blah. Now we don't have to do that because other people are, is dedicated to that. We have journalists, we have like, but it took that to make it visible for, to, to make those, those steps. And, and finally, I think one of the main drivers, and this might come as subjective, but I, I'm, totally backing up this here and wherever else. Um, I think it's the players. The players' activism has been key. Um, they have been probably the main driver of change in how competitions are run, um, how health conditions are improved, how mental uh, 
sort of health has improved. So um, having those individual players activists, like what we saw in Argentina with Maca Sanchez, for example, or as a collective when we saw the abuses in, well, unfortunately here in the US, but also before in, uh, in Colombia or even Afghanistan, like they as a collective have raised their voice and that clearly made a powerful sort of signal to the governing bodies and the private sector and like different actors and stakeholders. So um, yeah, I think players are key. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump off, off of that point because I think um, I, I agree with everything that you said. And I think in a way, if we think about it from, from a broader perspective, then of course there's been a wave of feminism um, but I think that the biggest drive has been the players and there's been this generational shift of players who at this point want to demand their place and they realize that they deserve a whole lot more than, than what they received in, in the last years. Um, and, and probably social media in a way and how you know globalization has changed the whole dynamics of the world because now if players from Israel or Chile, they, they see that you know players elsewhere did this battle and a collective action and were successful, that inspires us and it inspires other countries. And we can kind of see that contagious. Yeah, um, and, and, and I think that, you know, in so many cases we've seen, you know, it, it's not a copy paste, but, but there's a lot more connection between players that we didn't have, you know, in, in previous years. And, and we have to remember, I mean, there's been so many countries where it was illegal for women to play football up until, you know, the 70s and the 80s. Uh, so, so in many ways, there were barriers for, for women to even enter the game. It was, it was a male only territory. Um, and I think that because of, of that wave of, of feminism, that was the starting point of the cycle. And, and the cycle, once, once it happened and once it started growing, then people could see also the economic, you know, market for women's soccer because I think in many countries where there's not a whole lot of investment, uh, then it's a zero sum, you know, kind of thinking where if we give it to the women, then it's on the expense of the men. And now people are starting to realize that it's this whole side that, you know, can make a whole lot more profit that was not invested in, in so many years. Um, so, so I think there's larger societal reasons, but, but like what Camila said, I think that the players and the, that generational shift of, we're not ready to, to be treated as as not equal anymore has been probably the biggest biggest driving change. Um, and, and also, you know, we said we said some names of the clubs, you know, Barcelona and, and we see in England how how the game is has grown and some of the men's club that started a women's team, you know, because for so many years that the clubs were independent and they didn't really have it's much, much harder to grow a fan base. And the facilities and everything that that it means to be part of a team and and once the big clubs enter the game they could help with the professionalization because there are demands of this game you know that you need to, to train at a certain level a certain number of times and for so many years it, it stayed at the amateur level um so so it wasn't you know that it's that whole cycle of of how, of how you make that level attractive enough to to bring on fans um, so, so I think all of that combined is is the reason that we see the big boom in in women's football. Yeah, can I can I just to the last point that you made? It's because I I used to play also field hockey for many years, and I my my I have friends that are in athletics or in different sports, and and they look at like women's football like, but you have everything, like you have everything in place. Look at us, like, and compared to sports, I mean, women's football has a great sort of it's a paradox. So it's we have this massive infrastructure in place that we could like tap into, but we have so many barriers at the same time to access that, to to, to access stadiums, to access like proper um, staff, like so many barriers still in place, mostly driven by mainly bias or like because women are not representing the decision making like level. So. But I think as a collective sort of all the stakeholders should recognize that we are well better positioned than any other sport probably in the world to untap all this potential for women's football. Um, 
that yeah, I try to evangelize about that uh, every time I can. <laughs> yeah, no, but but exactly because access. I mean, when we talk about accessibility, you know, that that's one of the, that's has been for so many years because it's socially constructed as for men because you you know it was if women got any access to that then it would be at the the latest hours or not at all you know permitted to to this field but but i agree with you i mean the infrastructure has been there because popular you know soccer football is the most popular sport in the world um and when we got access and you know it's it's just this part of the cycle where it, it can be everything that we're seeing it today and and we need to see it in other places i mean we're seeing it in, in some of the big countries but but other countries are still many years behind in terms of that and, and access is yeah. is key and <laughs> Kaime is like when are you gonna like let me talk uh, I feel no, like but a privileged this, student here I'm just listening here, so please go ahead <laughs> here, here comes my like more union background I think I've heard from many federations or other sort of in the men's board um so it's like why why should this we, we like now subsidize women's football um and it's like well, first, it was banned for many years, so we definitely need to catch up for that sort of lack of investment. But secondly, it's like I don't know any other sports in the world that has been more subsidized than football around the world. It's so that they don't recognize that they have been for like subsidized by government for so many years, like building stadiums and having these like international tournaments and blah, blah, blah. I feel like it's making making us um, find to fill in an argument that sort of it doesn't apply necessarily to, to the real sort of historic standards. Yeah, and, and that's that's a difference between equality and equity, right? Because at the end of the day, there's been so many years where women's football has been banned, has not been invested at all. There's no money that's been poured there. And and governments and cities and, and you know, sponsors later on, but there's been so much investment in foot, in men's football, right? And and women's football, we see that investment, which is a fraction of what we see in the men's game. And you could already see the results. So so they're like, okay, now, now we're done. <laughs> but at, at the end of the day, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you. And, and because for so many years, you know, there's been none going into the women's game, that, that's where equity comes into play. But I think that the dividends and, and now the economic growth people that are smart enough see see the value in that as well. I think you, you see clearly, you know, that um, that there's change. Change is happening right before our eyes, you know, in that sense. Um, one of the things that you both were mentioning, you know, uh, it's kind of like the pride of, of the players, obviously, that, that if we can call it like that, that you know, being proud of, of like, you know, the quality and, and, and you bring. And also one opinion that I once heard from, a, you know, a, an executive at a top European club was that uh, they were also from a commercial perspective, they were also more, you know, women, women football players are more approachable. So that really makes it more, um, you know, it's easier for any stakeholder to really get attracted to the game. No? If you think about it, though, and, and I guess everything in when you speak about growth it starts with, let's say, a flywheel, as we were mentioning before, no, right, Karen? And, and, and I think this applies to any sport, but usually it's... Um, player performance, what starts that flywheel, because that increases the level of the game, um, which attracts more fans, which ultimately attracts more sponsors, more broadcasting. Camila, you were mentioning before, more journalists covering the, the events, no? So I guess my question then is, how do you improve even more the quality of the players to unlock that next level of growth? Um, yeah, <laughs> I saw. Um, yeah, I, I think that what we see in the women's game now, you know, if, if we look across the globe, it, it's really it's really amateurism versus professionalism, because in the countries that we see professionalism, when the players are getting all the conditions that they need, the amount of trainings they need to train the staff, uh, then then you see that the level has gone up tremendously. The the pace of the game, the level of the game. You know, from from 20 years ago to now, I, I think the shift has been 
tremendous. And, and even today, when you see different national teams play against each other or club teams that have the resources versus club teams that don't have the resources, um, that's where you see the major difference. And I think that the key is, I mean, and, and it's always this argument of, you know, what comes first, you know, the, the egg or the chicken, right? Uh, but, but at the end of the day, I mean, this is a game that requires the, the physical, you know, effort that you need to train at that level. And when you don't have that access to, to everything that the game demands, the, the level's not going to be high. And there's no, you can't escape from that because in, in team sports, it's not like individual sport where you have this individual person who's very talented and, and could do something or, or bring a medal. Um, and, and we can't run away in team sport from investment. So the more we're going to professionalize the game, the more we're going to invest into players, give them the proper conditions, give them what, what this game demands physically, then we're going to see, you know, the level going higher and higher. Um, and, and I think that we can see really live examples from from these past years of places that have done that versus places that ha just haven't done that. Um, you know, so so for me, it's really just amateurism versus professionalism. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, I think we can avoid this sort of conversation on 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 the labor conditions. it's 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 unavoidable on on how. You want, if you want to unleash talent, you need to give them proper conditions to do that. And that means the basics of like infrastructure, health and the stuff. But I want to also advocate not only for, for players. I mean, you can have players being treated decently well, but if you don't have, I don't know, a technical team and a staff and a medical team that it doesn't accompany that sort of ecosystem for performance, it's, it's very hard. And at the heart, I mean, there are many things that investment and money can do, but I think we should start by just the basic step of like, okay, if you want to run a club, if you want to run a team, if you want to like lead success, you need to treat them as professional. And that not necessarily requires tons amount of money. Um, and let me give you an example of, we were talking one of my best friends, she works at the union. She was former captain of one of the main um, clubs in the country. and. She was doing her thesis and she asked me, when did you ever thought that you could be a professional player? And I was like, truly never, because I never had like any reference in my country. Like I was surprised to like learn that 20 years later, since 1991, I figured out that there was a women's world cup, like everything came late for me. I didn't have any sort of, we were in a bubble of, we didn't get that information in my country. so. I didn't have any reference. And when I thought about being a professional, it was near like the men. Like I was sure that I could play with men. That was my sort of world. Um, and I asked her back, like, because she's younger than me. And I was sort of like, probably she has a completely different answer. And she, and she said like, well, I've been playing in clubs since I was nine years old. But the first time that I really thought I could be professional was just like a couple of years ago. She's like 20 something. Um, when for the first time the club decided that we were going to play in the main stadium. And when I played there with the people and with like the preparation and everything it was like, I came out of the field and I'm like, maybe I can do this forever. <laughs> I mean, for a, like, for a, for a career. And it struck me that that club didn't have any problems to do that before. Uh, they have the money, they own the stadium, like, but it's treat them as professional. Um, and that for certain, trust me, it's going to, it's, it will, um, translate on the field. And just to give you another example, because the, since I, I, I went to the final recently, Portland again, Kansas, Kansas have now a new infrastructure, like campus, probably is the, the best and newest and biggest campus for just women club around the world. And some like the reflection of some of the players were like the, just the feel of having our own thing and like being professional like the performance has like gone like up and they were in the final uh unexpectedly for many uh they were in the final so i think i mean going back to your point i think it, it's it's an ecosystem that needs to be built uh but that needs to sort of the basis is there's, there has to be a willingness to treat
players as professional at every corner of, of the journey. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. You know, when we talk about the, the societal level, right? So so it's it's not even just in football. When I was a kid, you know, there was no league to, to play in. And then, so I couldn't dream like you to, to become a player. And my role models were male role models because I couldn't see anybody that, that was like me. Um, and and when we talk about, you know, the larger level and, and how players are treated or viewed, I think that we also have to take into account the fact that, you know, because it was a male dominant sport for so many years and, and litter girls couldn't even dream of becoming players, uh, we don't really get, you know, if, if every boy goes to play football, not every boy, not every girl goes to play, you know, football because she doesn't think that it, she belongs there, that it's her place. And, and at the end of the day, it's a numbers game as well, because if you only have in, in one country that has 9 million people, you only have 1,000 female players as opposed to 100,000 male players, the pool of talent is, is smaller as well. So, so it's, when it's socially constructed only for men and we don't get, we don't give every girl the chance to play football, the, the pool of talent is not going to be as big as well. And then right. when they grow up, are they going to endure the treatment that they get, like you're saying, and, and the, the entire ecosystem of a performance-based sport and an elite sport. And, and when we see, you know, in the U.S. probably being the only exception in the world where football is, is considered a, a more female dominant sport than, than men, even here, we saw the same discrimination, you know, and the same fight for equal pay. And just now that that shift of building a campus that is just for women, that that does not exist anywhere else in the world. Uh, but the entire the entire thing from from the larger societal level to the structural level to, to the, you know, interpersonal relationship. Do, I, do my parents let me or not let me go to play because it, it's there's so much stigma around women's football. Uh, to what I believe about myself, you know, do I belong on the field or not belong on the field? So I think for for women, you know, we, we have to fight through all these different level of barriers uh, to, to even become players. And if we succeeded, you know, to, to go through all of those, then we can talk about amateurism versus professionalism. But but it's it's this whole circle that we have to go through even before we, we enter the field. Mm -hmm. You both mentioned the the ecosystem, which I, I totally agree with. It's not just, I mean, the ecosystem, when you think about it, it's not only the players, but also the leaders, the executives in, in teams or governing bodies or, or wherever, or even even referees, everybody that's involved in the game. No? So I guess the next question that I have there is, um, what issues do you see um, for, for you know or, or that the industry faces to really grow the ecosystem as a whole rather than just one element or one pillar of it Camila, I don't know if you want to jump in for that one or Karen sure um and I think I'm gonna go back to like the the bias and and, and discrimination and I think there's a consistent view that still women's football is even at the highest level of decision making. It's like an appendix of like the men. Um, and that is a it's it's a political problem, but it's, it's a practical problem. Um, because when you want to plan or try to access or try to promote investment to the game, um, given that we are sort of this second tier uh, agenda, Usually everything takes longer, everything comes late, everything. So when we talk about ecosystem, um, if you ask many federations or even, um, yeah, at the national level, uh, how many how many federations have like an integrated women's department? Um, when we started like five, five years ago, our federation didn't have any. Um, so we sort of required and pushed to, for one to be created. Um, and if you don't have a counterpart to work, that's, that's a basic like challenge. Um, if you ask many federation till this day, do you have a strategy for women's football? Um, they, many don't have 
Um, so how do you going to attract investors if you don't know, like, what's the plan? What do you expect? Where are your ambitions? And how are you going to get there? Uh, it's really hard. So, um, of course, that has changed over time. But I think we're still in a point that we need to, we struggle. I mean, I'm talking about the elite and I'm talking about, like, the rest of the world and what what uh, can refer to the amateurs and the professionals many the, there there are many challenges across those both worlds um and and if you have players that need to work like two three four like jobs to just make it work and you would imagine that a country for example like the us wouldn't need to do that but like a couple of years ago they did this campaign of like no more hassles like side hustles uh, because many of them, they were like playing the best teams in the world, but at the same time, they were working at like Amazon and like th things that were works that jobs that were flexible enough that allowed them to stay in the game. But also those jobs were very sort of making them even more vulnerable financially than like having a proper job. So. This, we're talking about players that risk so much to just be part of the game. So it's like, how do we sort of create this ecosystem where they can just focus and have the minimum and like allow them to grow? Um, but yeah, I think it's we need to sort of there is a pyramid to make it like at the top, at the confederation level, at the national level. And I think everyone has their own responsibility on this and their role in unions too. I don't want to keep unions on the side and like we we are making that effort too we're pushing our unions to 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 be a collective voice for men and women um and that has i i i've always been transparent that has been uh that's been a journey too for for them because they have represented men for like decades and decades so um but we're pushing for this the same as other stakeholders but we still have a, a long way to go i think yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that the, at the end of the day, the common thread is is the discrimination, the bias, the fact that women for so many years and still in so many parts of the world, they're not seen as, as part of the game. Um, and, and when we look at the majority of the federations, uh, like Amira said, I mean, there's no strategy to develop women's football. Uh, when FIFA gives away money that is meant only for women's football nobody's held accountable to see how that money is spent a lot of time that money is is taken into other uh, other projects that are that are for uh younger men um and and we have to be very honest i mean i, I think that almost I, i'm not gonna say every federation but i think that the majority of the federations in the world failed at doing what they're supposed to do and that is to promote the women's game as well um, and and in so many cases that affects everything. So it affects, like we said, we talked about before, you know, the access part of it, but it also affects the the way to grow the investment and the economic part that is gonna translate into the level, uh, you know, because they, they don't see it as a product. It's it's like this thing on the side that we have to do to check a mark to get some more funds to do, uh, just just because we have to. Uh, and and when federations, when some of the federations started realizing that and investing more, then then again we, we keep talking about the the circle that keeps feeding itself. But but the very bottom line of this and and the ecosystem as a whole, you know, the the common thread is the fact that the bias and the discrimination and how women were viewed um, and and football being a male only territory, um, I, I think that's been. The, the, the key thing to, to change and that's and that is when we when women are seen as as equal part of the game and and it's not one over the other it's not a zero sum because there's this whole new crowd that that we've never addressed and we've never seen them as part of the game um then then it really trickles down to to everything and it's not i mean we we we, we need to be really really honest because it's not just federations i mean it's the governing bodies it's fifa it's uefa it's how they've treated, you know, the, the women's game for so many years. We see it in, in the prize money. We see it in the, the number of competitions. We see it in 
you know, Camila can, can expand on that as well. But in, in some regions in the world, you know, the, the, the way that the international competitions are structured are completely different to, to the men. And like we said, when we were kids, we, we couldn't even dream about becoming professional players. Uh, and I think that now, you know, we are this generation that sees from from literal, you know, six year old us to to the fact that, you know, it is possible to become professional players. And, and I think that driving that kind of change is is really making that difference. And it's going to continue to make that difference in the ecosystem. But if the discrimination stays on the governing bodies, you know, from the international to the federations, uh, then it's going to be much, much harder to to really see the, the potential of the growth that, that this game in the women's side can, can do. Yeah, and I, we can talk about it a little bit more, but in we did a, a few, um, very recently, uh, a, a report in April on, on the men's side. So there was this massive overload of, of, of how, how many games the players uh, over the years and how that impacts like physical and mental health uh we saw like all the traveling how that like it, it's overcrowded and like from the top 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 like players they have been open about this and that they want more rest and they want like a little bit of holiday with their, with their family that makes sense um but on the women's side we did the same exercise and we found the completely opposite result it's like they don't have enough games in their calendar through the year to have a sustainable career. So if you don't have a calendar that sort of reflects the need of the game, we're, we're stuck at some point. We have, a, we have a ceiling. So, I mean, we have discussed it with FIFA. I think we're, we're making progress. We, we're sort of making a dialogue with them on this and how sort of creating a more sustainable calendar for particularly for those, um, for those countries that are the majority really that don't qualify for the World Cup. Um, because if you don't qualify, there's no incentive for this federation to keep the national team alive. And like they, we see that this phenomenon that where many countries like, it could pass two, two and a half years that they don't hear about the federation and, 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 and the national team is like stuck there. So how do, how do we sort of maintain them active? How do we create channels of like um, tournaments that make, the federations and the leagues and the players and everyone involved to have this sort of virtuous cycle where what they're playing is sustainable. And we try to avoid what Karen said before, like getting into a World Cup where you have professionals and in the same World Cup, that is like the main stage of the sport, you have amateurs. And that is, it's, it's not good for the game. It's not good for the competition. It's not good for, for the players. So. Um, I think we're trying to narrow that sort of um, elite amateur um, gap that we still have. Yeah, and and we'll we'll just add one more thing that I think is is also changing in in the past years, and that is, I mean, we are women, so we can give birth, right? And and I think for for so many of us, a lot of time being pregnant and and giving birth was the end of the career. Um, and that, that's how we saw it for so many years. Um, and, and it's not politically correct to say it, but, but being pregnant is like this injury, right? Because you're out for a year. You don't really know. You're not really sure how your body is going to come back. You don't really know how that's going to affect it. Uh, but, but even economically, what do you do? Right? So I think, and, and that's also something that, you know, we, we put on the table, you know, with FIFA and, and the agreement, but there's still not, a, you know, not every player in the world knows. Uh, about the the new maternity leave uh, and their rights now with, when they sign a contract. Uh, so I think also taking into account that we are we are equal, but we are also different because we can give birth and and educating players that pregnancy and and giving birth is not the end of the career uh, is also gonna help us make sure that that women stay longer in the game that they're not you know coming out of that as well. Uh, and, and I think that's been one of the, the most important changes uh, in the ecosystem, in the industry uh, for, for women's football. Yeah, yeah. The rep yeah, you're totally right. The, the report showed that it's even the salaries, I mean, it's on the one side, salaries, 
they uh, get out of the game or because they want to they have a family they, they didn't see that as a something that you could go hand in hand and keep a career we have seen like small changes in in different countries because they they have like more protections at the national level but in general that's the case um and and, and also retiring right at, at a younger age uh, because yeah yeah so we're lo the point is that we're losing generations and generations and generations of like players that are not achieving their peak because we know that women achieve their peak like a little bit later than men so we're losing that sort of elite talent that we need to like propel the game um because we're not putting these sort of basic conditions and, and and regulations in place that are still not very well implemented yet yeah what i'm what i'm hearing you say and, and i fully agree uh, is there's there's um there's a matter of mindset really changing at all levels second piece would be obviously more um, games uh, makes sense the more you play the more competitions you have you know you, you you improve as a player as teams coaches everybody improves with more games you know with experience as, as with anything in life no um and also finally the, the final point that I, I take away from that is the huge amount of resources um that you need um in terms of support call it support for maternity leave call it uh, knowledge about different um uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, legal conditions, whatever you want to mention there, no? And then you were also speaking about making it unique to, you know, women's football. It's not just a matter of I'm uh, copying all of this and I'm applying this to men's football to make it, you know, uh, 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 women's football. No, I think it needs to be unique, no? So I guess my question is, other than those call it pillars that we were mentioning, is there anything else um, that will enable uh, to professionalize, you know, women's football in a way that it, it's unique? It has its own values, and it's identified as a yeah, a unique sport. Um, I I think that we we touched, you know, throughout the conversation a little bit about the the unique. Uh, characteristics of, of the women's game and, and the things that we are seeing in, in the past years. I think that, you know, we see women that are that are activists, that are using their voice um, in, in ways that are far beyond just the game, um, you know, and, and it's about the place of, of women in, in society and in the world, and, and they're driving that change uh, through, through their, you know, your unique voice on the field. Um, there, there's been a lot of talk in in recent years that uh, because at the end of the get the day we know that there are things that are um, we need to fix in in the men's side as well uh, and because women's football is is rebuilding you know from from the ground the, in these past years uh, that the women's game is actually the hope or the the chance to fix some of the the ill things in the system in the men's game as well uh, so so it's this new chance to to make sure that the industry can be rebuilt in a different way, and then we can take those models into the men's game as well. Um, for many years, you know, we kept saying, even us players, right? So it's like, okay, the men they make all the money, the fame, and but we play with the heart and we care and and we play for because we we truly do love the game because we have to struggle so much just to just to step on the field. So I think that's that's shifting as well uh, but but you touched on on some of these points too i think the women you know because they're not see themselves as these mega superstars that nobody can can approach uh, they are more approachable we can see it in, in some of the interviews even after the the women's euro uh, you can relate to them you can see them as as people you know that are not they don't have that the spokesperson and and that person and all that pressure to, to just be you know pl players that have to answer you know in a very you know diplomatic way but you can really see uh, the person that's behind the player and i think that's something that many fans can can relate to um and and if we talk about you, you know the the larger ecosystem i think that as we shift you know and and we let more women in general be part of the game whether it's you know in positions of leadership whether you know, it's it's on the field, and and whether it's as fans, you know, then then we can have this shift that it's an inclusive game that everybody has 
part of that. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the women are driving that, that kind of conversation about being inclusive and, and truly football being a game, connecting everybody regardless of where you're from, your religion, your background, your, your sexual orientation, there's a place for everybody on the field. And I think the women are the ones driving that kind of conversation. Um, and if we talk, you know, historically, some of the big problems in, in football has been, you know, violence, whether it's with, with the fans and, and th throughout the years. And, and as we do that shift into a more inclusive environment where families and women and children and men and all have a place in, in the stands and, and as part of the game, uh, th then I think that, you know, the women's football, it, women's football in general is, is what driving that kind of shift to, to a game with no violence and, and just more values that everybody can be a part of. Yeah, I think you, I mean, we have talked about this uh, during the the webinar, but it, it's it's true that it's a traditionally a men's sport. And but I think I would make a distinction on that is that this sport has been since it's in modern ways. I mean, the modern sort of era, um, the seventies, it has been marketed as a men's sport. That doesn't mean that women weren't playing since decades or like even a century ago. Um, and we always try to like invisibilize that. I don't know if that's an English word, but to make it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a word today, it's okay. <laughs> um, but again, we are, we are assuming that we go through like the audience that were like 40 years ago and like not responding to this diverse and new like uh, sort of market out there. And yeah, going back to the point, in, in investment is, um, I mean, we can avoid that question. The fact is that many of even the federations or FIFA even like they run into this problem on how when we are asking for more investment, um, still women football was attached to men football. And it's only until recently that we have unbundled, unbundled those, pro the, those products. So now we are starting recently, only a couple of years ago to see, okay, how women actually are performing. We have data, we have like, how, how many people are going, how many people are seeing. Before we didn't have that data. So we were making decisions out of like stereotypes and like bias completely. So I think that is gonna make a massive change in the next like few years. And regarding um, values, I think, yeah, we're in, I think we're in different moments around the world. Um, but generally, as Karen said, I think women's football in general is, is more welcoming to all type of like minorities and it's more inclusive in general. Um, we went to the final and like all this LGBTQ community flags were there and I was like, oh, in tears and it was beautiful. But um, that's not necessarily what you see in other countries because it, it might be like dangerous or um, it's really attached to like a certain masculinity still, even though it's women's football. So I think we, you're, you're definitely right on there are certain values that have been developed for like it's more family oriented that's for sure but i think we should not take that for granted and assume that that's going to be the case forever we're seeing uh gradually it's a little bit of violence now in the women's game too so we need to like make sort of make it a, an effort to keep it that way and 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 sort of put a value on that and and and, and that's something that the women's football can sort of project and, and we can tap into. Um, and being open, the, the, we have our own challenges inside the game. Um, we have this great sort of value and like it's, it's a safe space for many women to come um, from, from the LDTB community to participate in the sport. And that's, uh, that is amazing. But at the same time, we have sort of in many countries, this culture of like abuse, psychological, labor, um, physical abuse, that I think it's only going to grow uh, in terms of like how many cases we're going to see around the world. And that's sad, but at the same time, it's because women are speaking up and um, they're not going to stand those type of relationship anymore. Um, so yeah, I think we're optimistic, but at the same time, like we need to make sure that those challenges, we're very clear about them and, and, and tackle them. 
Yeah, you know, I, I, I 100% agree because I think, I mean, the challenges that we have in the game are also the challenges that we have in society and, and safety, you know, and, and sexual abuse or just abuse in general, which happens to women outside, happens in, in the game as well. And, and we see that in, in every country, I think, even, um, you know, with the just what happened in the U.S. is is out in the public because it's it's very, you know, outspread. But there we know. Um, you know, because we were sometimes behind the scene, but we, we know of so many different cases of, of abuse in the women's game. And, and also, you know, because traditionally it's it's male coaches also that coach women because there's not a whole lot of, of women's coaches and that, you know, power difference and, and the hierarchy is, is something that has has to be addressed because the safety of, of the players, of the women um, in society in general, of course, but that also translate into the game if we don't put the proper protocols and the proper you know safety measures to make sure that 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 is within within the industry i think that's key for for the building of of the women's game but but i think that for me the general overall value uh you know of the women's game is, is the fact that a lot of times it's it's attached to uh, social change in general um and and you don't really see, I mean, the, the weight that you put on, on almost every women player as opposed to male player, they, they're not expected to, to hold a flag of any social change. Whereas the female players, a lot of times they're expected to talk about, you know, the, the next generation and, and you know, the, the LGBT community and women in general in, in terms of sexual abuse or, or anything else. And, and I think driving that social change also reflects reflects on on a broader level but at the end of the day i think you know if we, if we look 10 15 years forward you know i would want any player to to be able to just be a player and whoever wants to carry the weight of that social change do that you know if if they feel like that's that's important to them um but but that at this point this is this is the the main two things that go together that are different than the men's game. Yeah, and, and, and I guess, or very briefly, no, because this is going to be, for, for me, at least for my, my last question, and, and I want to make it brief so we can get to some of the questions from the audience. Um, with that vision in mind, Karen, that you just mentioned, um, how, yeah, we're talking about the changes that the industry needs to make from a societal point of view as well, but how do the unions also help the players? Um, you know, how, how can how can they be involved, I don't know if you, share some of the details of, of how how that happens yeah i mean do you want to go no uh, i'll go after you <laughs> okay. um i think the basic is um i i want to be open like in women's football in general the, having unions or in uh, like women associations to represent them this is something recently new um not for all countries but for like the majority of countries that's something new so i think we're in a point where sort of we as players i'm retired but i'm talking about players um we're sort of learning on how to use that voice collectively so we're not so we're still in a, i think in a learning process uh that is very interesting and but you can see how that this network of unions have like I'll give you an example. We, we did an event in, in 2017 in Chile uh, with some players uh, from Latin America, and we were the only union at the point. Now, like Uruguay has the women department, uh, Argentina, it's completely integrated. In Brazil, they have their, the union. So it's like in five years, it sort of, it's a network now of like women and former players and players like working at their unions. But, um, how how do we do it it's mainly being their voice making their demands visible representing their rights and going back to the point that we that we talked before is how how do we make women's football a priority in every of sort of the decision making process in in in, in nationally and, and and internationally um and i always say this that sort of in in the women maybe it's not too much on the men's side but in the women given that it doesn't have the priority that it should be given we sort of are um 
we're very active on being so uh, co-developers of the game. So sometimes they don't come up with innovative solutions. So we go and like offer that uh, to the to the federations or 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 even FIFA. Uh, but we have sort of a different responsibility in the women's side. So we're more. I think we we're even more active in that sense of like co-creating the game. Uh, and I'll give you like small example in, in, in Chile, um, we didn't have, for example, health insurance, uh, even that the younger uh, male had it, the, the top sort of women's league didn't, didn't have it and, and it was super expensive for them. So we approached like a private insurance and we did all these like models and this could be like the, the great way we presented it and it ended up being implemented. So probably that's something that the men don't have to do because they have like certain things in place, but we have to push for like the basics and, and be more, more in, in innovative. And I think in, in general, um, like you see in business, this sort of shift in like stakeholders and this new wave of like shareholders. I think that's, that's something that needs to be translated also into the, to the football world. I think there's this view like stereotype that unions will go and just be like conflict and war and and i think that's a view of the past where we have been you have shown that we have been very constructive over like decade so and i don't think i mean trust me women players are the first one that want to see this grow because if there's nothing there to negotiate how like we need to grow the game to to be able to negotiate something uh so i think conflict of like different stakeholders is inevitable, but like how do we inst institutionalize that to make it the most efficient and the best to grow the game? And we have seen in countries where this is like common, where I don't know, the Nordics or Australia or the US have this sort of collective bargaining agreements that have laid down and they sit down every other year to sort of negotiate. That's, I think that's a great way uh, to make it happen, but also having people from from the representative of the players at the decision making in the federations for example we have seen that even in in in, in for example in in south america where the peruvians or argentinians like they have this great collaboration with with the federation so how can we sort of that dynamic make it in a norm and not an exception of how do we develop the game um but i i, I totally agree and i, I think you know, kind of going back to the beginning of the conversation. I mean, it's it's really to make it, you know, a priority. And and I think when when unions put women's football as as a priority, then then they can help and, and allocate resources to to do some of those fights on on the institutional level. Uh, I tell you, you know, in, in Israel, some of the things that we've done, you know, over COVID, what happened when the whole world was in lockdown. A lot of times that the professionals kept playing and the non-professionals didn't play. Uh, so, so for us, that was an opportunity to to push for the professionalization of the women's league as well. So, so that was one thing that we pushed with the union. Uh, other times where there was clear discrimination in in the budgeting, you know, when we talk about public funding, um, then the union can give the lawyers the resources to do those kind of fights to fight the discrimination. Uh, on on the institutional level, um, you know, and and like I, mean, I said, you know, CBAs and negotiations, and to push for for equality and for the right conditions for the female players, uh, but it starts with unions putting women's football as a priority, and and we've been honest with I think with our unions and and also you know with FIFPRO because because even at the union level, for for a few years back we were not seen as as part of the game and and it's just in in the recent years that that women got into into the unions but at the end of the day the unions are there to protect you know the players regardless if they're men or women and and the fact that you know we are there now to to be able to continue to push for those changes and to put those things on the table so that can be fixed uh, that I think at the end of the day unions have a whole lot of knowledge and and sometimes depending where you're from but they have also the resources and the legal resources to combat the the institutionalized discrimination and to be there in front of the other stakeholders 
uh, to continue the fight and drive the change. Good. Well, uh, I want to thank you both very much. I do want to get if you let me um, at least one question from the audience, just one. Um, maybe we just um, can go over for five minutes. Um, and Carolina, she was asking about the turning point being, or if you agree, if the turning point was um, um, the, the World Cup in 2019. Um, and then I guess I want to spin it off. In, 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 so that was her question. I also want to add, are we at a point now that it's so popular or that we need more single events like that? Like, you know, turning points? Or is it already a momentum that's been, you know, created where it's so many things happening that it's just driving growth to the game. So I don't know what you think. So on one hand, was 2019, was the World Cup, was a turning point for the, for the game itself? And in the future, do we need more single turning points like that? Or is it just a point that now we've already created that interest that it's just going to be a wheel that's going to keep on turning? I, I'm going to answer your second question before I I hope uh, really that um, we don't need sort of these massive events to like drive the change that we're up above that and now we're we're going to the grassroots um, that would be my hope and I think um, that is what we need if we want to like going back to the gap of amateur professionalism that's the only way that we can achieve that so if you want to, if you want to keep having those massive events as like the best of the best of the game, you need to make them better and better and better, and that means having players that fit into that that are very well prepared um, from all different nations. So that means doing the job at, at home um, and at the regional level, because it's really, really confederations have a major, major role in this uh, with the with the regional tournaments. And on the other hand, I, I would agree that definitely France was uh, like, it moved the needle for sure, uh, because, because we had a very, like an amazing reaction to the fans, the broadcasting and everything. And we had, and, and it was the first time that we had the data to like publicly be, be available, like, like sending that a signal to the private sector and different stakeholders, like this is where we're going. It's, that was fantastic. Um, was the only one? I don't know because if I, I, I'm from Latin America, so I'm going to give you my perspective too on that. Um, for us, the, the the prior tournament, which was Copa America, was the turning point. Uh, so we went with this uh, proposal from the union to the federation to say, listen, uh, there's haven't been a World Cup in in, in South America. You should have a women's world cup in, in in chile and they were like okay you're crazy but i'm gonna think about it blah, blah, blah. and at the end it was like okay we're not gonna propose the world cup but we got we got the copa america in chile and and the reaction was unbelievable of the fans like we filled the stadiums the broadcasting they saw i mean they gave the rights to the tv broadcaster for free at that point because they thought that uh the reaction would be that like so strong. And then when they realized the massive numbers that they were receiving, it's like, okay, we're not gonna do that again. We're not gonna, we're not gonna give them away for free for sure. So that was like in terms of marketing and like the like the perception of the federation, the people, the players, like it changed everything for us. So I think we need to come to a point where we don't only see the World Cup as like the main driver, we need to start looking a little bit more like below and see, okay, what what our regions are doing to improve the game. And that's when we, at the end, talk about like the international conduct. How do we make it more sustainable? And, and, and that really reflects the, the, the women's football needs. But yeah, I, I totally agree. I think, I, I mean, the 2019, I think it was, it was a turning point because that was globally um, the first time where, you know, it kind of broke down every assumption that there was about the women's game because for so many years, everybody said, you know, nobody cares. It's not profitable. It's not interesting. You don't attract a crowd and then breaking the records and the level was high because it started professionalizing. So, so people started seeing 
women football in, in a different light. Uh, and it brought a lot of money and so many viewers around the world and the fans, you know, came came to the stands. So it was like this picture of the future of what we all hope that women football could look like. And I think it, it sparked, you know, that, that was part of, of what sparked uh, for, for players that could never see or imagine themselves, you know, being professional players and being treated, you know, as as real athletes. Uh, that was a change on, on the individual level of players. And that created also the collective movements that, that we've seen since uh, because they could finally see, you know, th there's the saying, you can't be what you can't see. Um, like we didn't have any role models to, to look up to. Um, but, but I think like Camila, I mean, we, we cannot wait four years or two years for, for these big events. At the end of the day, we need to start looking at the entire ecosystem and when he, and the most important thing is is the grassroots because the the base of the pyramid is is the most important to to eventually get to the top of of that pyramid but and that's where the professionals are um but if we don't if we don't look at, at the base and if we don't treat all the other things that we talked about for the past hour um then then we're gonna we're gonna find stagnation um so i think that these events are are very important in starting the process uh but but that's when we need to keep working to to make sure that it doesn't just stop there and and we're not just waiting for for these amazing events but but it, it just needs to be the start of the process um and and nobody knows what what the future is going to go but i think that this this is one you know place where we are already seeing so much that that is happening and is going to continue to happen but i think that it's on on us you know people from the industry players uh to continue to, to drive in that change and to make sure that it doesn't just stop there great so i think that's a, a great place to, to to end this great webinar i want to thank you karen camilla i want to thank the audience uh, for sorry we couldn't get to all the questions um but thank you for being on the other side Hope you learned uh, as much as I did, definitely. Um, and uh, thank you all very much and, and have a great rest of your day.